Uh, before I start, let me say a big thank you to ODI for organizing this very important event, um, which is a major um, issue when it comes to West Africa and Africa for that matter. Um, um, I am Frank Ottry, and uh, I work with the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra. And uh, we are particularly interested in peace and security issues. So this platform is a very important one for us to be able to discuss some of the security threats that confront uh, West Africa and the African region. So um, I'll start by giving a brief overview of the vulnerabilities that confront uh, West Africa as a region. And uh, you would realize that uh, Already, West Africa is confronted by several structural and operational challenges, a uh, list of them being uh, you have pandemics, poverty, endemic poverty, uh, armed conflict, natural resource uh, conflicts, and porous borders, which increasingly com confront many countries in West Africa. But uh, we are talking about um, organized criminal activity and if we look at the superimposition of some of these criminal activities, such as human trafficking, drug trafficking, terrorism, uh, cigarette trafficking across the Sahel, uh, as well as uh, coup d'etats, and then uh, militancy and terrorism, which are not really about organized criminal activity, but uh, other security threats that also confront the region. When these are superimposed, on the existing structural challenges facing the region, then uh, it gives you a fair idea of the kind of threats that uh, we face as uh, a region. So just to give you paint a, a brief picture of some of the vulnerabilities and security risk that are uh, facing uh, the West African sub-region. Um, with the superimposition, these are some of the um, um, movements I also I'll say, or the general scheme of uh, some of the threats facing West Africa. You have arms, drugs trafficking, cigarette trafficking, uh, but also religious uh, fundamentalism, which, uh, as we know, it, those of us who follow the Mali crisis will also realize that it's a very huge issue that confronts the, the region. I'll quickly skip this because. Uh, we don't have time. But uh, I am looking at a, a case from Ghana, uh, particularly concerning uh, drug trafficking, which is one of the most uh, pervasive uh, criminal activities confronting Ghana as a country, even though it is not peculiar to a Ghanaian situation. But it is the most significant as far as organized criminal activity is concerned. And that is why I would want to focus my presentation on drug trafficking, uh, but there are also other criminal activities that also pose a challenge to governance and politics within the, the country. And um, there have been several high-profile cases when it comes to drug trafficking within Ghana, and one of them was the 2005 arrest and incarceration of a member of parliament, but also a, a, a traditional chief within the Brun Hafu region uh, one called Erika Martin. But uh, within the presentation, there are certain names I may have to skip because of the sensitivities of the, of the issue. But uh, because this is a case that was in the public domain for a long time, that is the reason why I decided to mention the name of the member of parliament in question. And in 2005, uh, US law enforcement agencies arrested uh, a sitting MP but also a traditional chief called Erika Martin uh, for possessing about um, two, that is, um, possessing about six million US dollars worth of heroin. And uh, that was on, an, on transit from the UK to the US and was intercepted somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, this was a very high profile case uh, and it sent a lot of uh, shock waves across the Ghanaian political landscape. Uh, further public inquiries into the situation revealed that uh, 
drug trafficking networks permeate deeply into the Ghanaian political landscape. And these in investigations, as I will highlight as we go on, will demonstrate that uh, drug trafficking is a real problem confronting Ghana as a country and then West Africa as a whole. Um, when he was arrested, he was in possession of about 136 pounds of heroin. And that was en route from the UK to the United States. Um, the case lasted about two years, where he was uh, sentenced to about 120 months uh, of a prison sentence, with five of them being under uh, supervision. Um, what uh, this um, now? I would like to talk about uh, how he came to be connected within the Ghanaian. And you know, we have a cultural system of a hierarchy where the wealthy are placed at the top of the hierarchy, but also a patriarchal system that uh, promotes uh, wealth and sees the wealthy as more of a heads of society. So if you come to our churches, social clubs, old school, but also alumni networks, uh, and also chieftaincy issues, the wealthy are usually put at the very high level of their society and well respected. Uh, the member of parliament in question was uh, seen by many as a philanthropist. And therefore, when uh, he was arrested, um, it sent a lot of um, mixed reactions because issues like this also serve as a platform for political opponents to, to score <coughs> uh, political points. Um, when he was uh, sentenced, the public inquiry into the situation uh, also came to mention some non-governmental organizations and foundations that are also very closely associated with the case. But interestingly, when a sitting minister, whose name I cannot mention, came to be associated with the case, um, he was suddenly made a minister of the interior in a very sudden presidential reshuffle. The organization that was looking into the case was the Narcotic Control Board of Ghana. Now, the Ministry of Interior supervises the Narcotic Control Board. So it was effectively uh, difficult for a Narcotic Control Board to investigate a Minister of Interior that supervises the work <laughs> of the Narcotic Control Board. And that is how the case, investigation into that case ended. But other officials of Narcotic Control Board that were found also to be uh, implicated in the situation were either dismissed or transferred to other positions. So that is how deeply uh, organized criminal activity permeates the political landscape in Ghana. Because in this case, the, the ministerial reshuffle was initiated by the president, the then sitting president of the, of the country. Um, I will highlight some of the key characteristics of the case quickly, uh, um, how this case uh, came to be seen, the use of foundations or NGOs. Um, what happened was in, in this particular case, um, these NGOs were seen to be exporting but also benefiting from importations from close associates of this member of parliament who was arrested in the US. And uh, even though the minister who was an also under investigation admitted to receiving donations from the member of parliament, he denied involvement in any money laundering or uh, drug trafficking uh, case. But uh, it wasn't very difficult to figure how foundations and uh, non-governmental organizations are used as shell mm -hmm. or front to uh, further the activities of uh, criminal groups. Um, but one also dimension of this um, uh, whole drug trafficking and organized criminal activity is a political patronage, political patronage and clientelism, where we have a system in Ghana where you have a winner-take-all politics that has come to characterize uh, our governance system uh, within Ghana. Um, you have politicians giving assistance to their supporters, but also kinsmen. 
and that can range from many forms, paying school fees, paying utility bills, they distribute money for subsistence, and then also they help their clients to deal with um, government institutions, security organizations such as the police, and therefore this creates a system where criminals will be able to channel funds into a political activity. Um, you also have a system where the executive, be it the president, has expansive powers that enables him to also permeate the governance structures from the very top to the bottom. Uh, for instance, the, the president has the power to appoint over 4,050 individuals into various positions, as well as uh, 110 chief executives of various district, municipal, and metropolitan assemblies. So the president appoints, for instance, the chief of police, and then also you have the commissioner for human rights and administrative justice is also appointed by the president. So if you, you have a system like this, it becomes very difficult to ensure independence within um, judicial or legislative uh, system. But then also you have um, parliamentarians who are usually required to provide oversight responsibilities, also being the main, or should I say, also major beneficiaries of uh, expansive pre presidential powers because most of these appointees are also um, appointed as ministers and deputy ministers. So it becomes very difficult for them to hold the office of the president to uh, become very accountable. Let me just quickly um, say um, how uh, criminal activities have also led to an increase in the cost of elections within uh, the country. For instance, the um, 2008 campaign in Ghana was characterized by a lot of uh, allegations and counter allegations of huge monies being pumped into a campaign by drug barons. Um, the end result, if uh, just to, by way of a conclusion, is that uh, there is a lack of transparency in the electoral process and also a loss of uh, credibility in the whole political process. For lack of time, I'll just end my presentation here. We can go into the various discussions or issues when the time comes. Thank you very much.